Welcome to the Teacher's Toolkit for Literacy, the free podcast for motivated teachers and school leaders who want to inspire their students and school community in literacy learning. Make sure you subscribe to the show on your favourite podcast player, and for more amazing literacy resources, check out the show notes provided with every episode. Hi, I'm Sharon, and I'm the host of a Teacher's Toolkit for Literacy. In every toolkit episode, we bring you specific resources, tools, strategies, tips, techniques to help you in your job as a teacher of literacy. Firstly, we acknowledge and pay our respects to the Ghana people, the traditional custodians whose ancestral lands we gather on. We acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and relationship of the Ghana people to country, and we respect and value their past, present and ongoing connection to the land and cultural beliefs. Welcome newcomers to the Facebook group, to the podcast and our Teacher Vic resources. We love hearing the diverse reasons why teachers across the world are joining. So much deep and thoughtful and creative literacy work going on in our schools. Some recent comments from those who've joined us on the Teachers Toolkit Facebook group. They're looking for teaching best practices and discussion, ideas and support, professional learning around best literacy resources. And I think there's a lot of people on the Facebook group who are, just as this person said, always open to learning. Absolutely love that as a comment. Specifically interested in leading literacy in primary settings. And that's from a leader. We love, we've got teachers and leaders that join us um, as part of the group. Real and relevant literacy support. Um, a final year student at uni, I'm looking for communities that can help support my development as a teacher of literacy and we absolutely welcome all those new teachers into the profession. And uh, last one, I would like to find useful ideas to share with my class. So if you're not a member of the Teachers Toolkit Facebook group, we'd love you to join and introduce yourself to the group. This week, we are especially excited about a whole new section on our TeacherFit website providing online courses. More about that soon. So welcome to this podcast called The Hidden Power of Reading Journals. And in a big welcome back, welcome back to Phil. Thank you, Sharon. Great to be back. So good to have you back, co-host. Mm. Good to be able to be in discussion again with you around um, all things literacy. But before we do that, as you're welcome back, Phil, what have you been up to lately? Okay, I can give my speech now. No, just kidding. (laughs) Um, Well, one thing I was doing while I was absent was um, painting lots of rooms in the house, (laughs) which took me forever, and ceilings and... In fact, I've got a very funny would, feeling would that the podcasts were, um, well, I don't know. The mention of painting might have been, it's been a long process. Yeah, there was more paint on me than in, in the house, I think. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, you and the house are looking very good. Uh, but it uh, feels really good to be in the rooms now that that's finished. And also we got someone to help with the floorboards, which were very old floorboards that we discovered. Well, the originals. Uh, Jarrah Timber from Western Australia, and we had to source some of that to repair it. But then uh, they polished them. Oh, they just look fantastic, don't they? They yeah, absolutely do. Yep. So that's what you've been up to in um, our out of work life. What about work life? You really must share the huge project that you've been working on for the past, wow, 18, almost two years, 18 months, two years. Well, probably less than that, but because there's a group of um, computer programmers that helped with our TeacherVic website and they helped um, create a new section on online courses, which is going to be really valuable for people to do that anytime learning. So uh, if you join the TeacherVic membership, uh, you get really good discounts on those courses. So yeah, that was great work. And but uh, a really big bit of news this year was our daughter getting married and uh, next year. And well, getting engaged. Well, getting yes. engaged. <laughs> and um, that was a really momentous occasion, the engagement. Yep. Yes, yep. yes. And um, now we can proudly call ourselves the mother and the father of the bride. Yes. So we've got yeah. some time to prepare. 
Yep, absolutely. <laughs> yes, and enjoy all that comes with um, the not only the excitement of a wedding, but enlarging our family by in- including now another, well, another son, so a son-in-law. Yep. All right. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> we go just... on forever about our lives, but I think we better get back to teaching. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know. I yeah. think I do less of that chat when you're here, Phil. Yeah, you do. You go straight. Into I know. The topic. Yeah. When you're not here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't. I don't tend to chat away to myself. Although some people may argue that I do do a fair bit of that. Mm. Um, you being one of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're talking about the hidden power of reading journals. And just before Phil talks a little bit about what Struggle. we've seen as the, um, well, what we frequently see for teachers as the teaching struggle, um, the idea of reading journals might be something that you have integrated into your um, literacy learning, or this might be something entirely new. So we really want to go on a bit of an exploration and a delve into this podcast about why would we have a dedicated book or space for students to be journaling about their reading? And that really comes in response to um, some of the struggles that we notice teachers having around those things. So if you, you have a bit of a chat through, Phil, some of the teaching struggles that we've really identified the struggle that teachers have, I was thinking, were the looking for ways to deepen students' comprehension of what they're reading because sometimes um, that comprehension, you know, I've heard people in uh, high school say, you know, they come to high school and they, they can decode, they can read really well, but they actually don't understand some of the things they're reading and they consequently don't enjoy it. We want ways that this can be linked to what they're reading so it's more meaningful to them. So we talk, get the kids talking about their reading. We want to use writing as a tool to help students show their thinking about reading. And we want routines so this can happen on a regular basis. And they were the things I was striving for, for in my classroom as well. So, And I agree, Phil, that there is in the classroom the, uh, the opportunity to be able to catch students' thinking about their reading was always, you know, a real, um, I'm going to say dilemma for us. It was something that we would have a lot of conversations about. We knew we could find out, I guess, in some ways, you know, like the the comprehension sheet with the read the passage, answer these questions um, was a format that we're probably all still familiar with as teachers, but we were finding that it wasn't engaging our students in the kind of deep reading, especially with our older students, our middle upper primaries, who are really getting into much more complex, much deeper, thoughtful, rich texts. And to really be able to find out about the big thinking that they're doing around those books, um, that's where we really started looking for ways of finding... Yeah, because I think a a share reflection wasn't enough because we couldn't get around to enough students and um, it wasn't enough time. Well, Um, I don't know that I was even doing a share and reflect. I I wasn't even really thinking about, apart from a comprehension kind of activity sheet, I wasn't... I don't think... Like, to be really honest, that's where I probably started with finding out about what my students were thinking. Yeah, and after that, I went into um, let's, in our share reflection time, let's talk about the books we're reading. Um, and that was a really good opportunity to start really delving into what the kids were really thinking about their reading. But uh, it wasn't enough. So let's look at reading journals. Why did we go to those, Sharon? All right, so maybe we talk about first of all, what is a reading journal? So so reading journal is really, well, what I ended up as having and a lot of teachers that um, I know will actually have a dedicated book that they call the reading journal or a reader's notebook. So 
Yes, it could be incorporated into other literacy books or, you know, your English book or whatever. But the idea of it being a dedicated book, a book that is a place for these responses and these the thinking that we're doing, um, the way we're engaging with books, for it to be in one place seems to be a really good way to honour the process. I was just going to talk about the real value that I found in reading journals and why not only I was sold on them, but my students <laughs> were sold on them, was because for me, it was a way of how could I really find out what my students were thinking about as they were reading? So that it wasn't just a, after you've finished the book, write a review or um, answer these questions about a book. A reading journal really was a way of being able to give children a tool to be able to intentionally catch some of their thinking not after every read but with some really focused uh, prompts to really help them know what kinds of thinking good readers are doing as they're reading and then them being able to reflect on that um, in a response. So it's as they're reading that's a really good thing. Um, I also the fortunate thing is that you know when you look at the uh, CARA curriculum it's actually down there in black and white that this is a really good thing to do, isn't it? All right, so... To engage with and respond to literature. Right, so... Et cetera. Yeah, particularly um, in our literature strand where we're talking about engaging with and responding to literature, examining literature, analysing, interpreting and evaluating. These are all really fundamental pieces that are forefront and centre of the curriculum about how we engage students with a variety of texts across every year. So let's unpack um, and drill down into the reading journal and what they are and why they are so good. All right, so a reading journal, I don't know, you've, we both set up reading journals in different ways, I think. But for me, a reading journal really began as I just gave my students actually a dedicated notebook I don't think it was as big as, you know, there are other sort of English books that they were working with, but it was more of a, you know, a smaller book, an A5, I think, size book that I would give them that really let them start jotting some of their thinking into a dedicated space. Actually, what, how did you set yours up, Phil? I think it was a, just an exercise book, a normal exercise book that we called a reading journal. Yeah. Um, and... Just to have that uh, dedicated book was really great. I guess there are other things you can put in a reading journal besides um, responses to their reading. So, you know, it could be called a reader's notebook. But to get this started, um, I did find that if I was doing a read aloud, we would then use that read aloud um, to, you know, pause and prompt them with a question. And then they would write their responses, um, all of us, on the same book to start with. Yeah, I found a good way, a good place to start was by having children doing the thinking about the text that we were reading aloud. Because one of the difficulties I did come across in getting students to be writing about their own reading initially was because I don't think I set them up well enough to be thinkers, you know, to really be thinking about their reading and maybe that links a lot back to what's on the curriculum too, about that opportunity to talk and discuss their reading. And that's and that one of the things that I know that we both set up to try and overcome that too was one of the things was to have a turn and tell at the end of reading to actually be able to get children practising how to discuss their own reading. Yeah, so um, the read aloud becomes, uh, and then them responding in the reading journal all from the same book, becomes almost like a modelling um, of the process so that we later we can, they can then do it from their own books where they, um, yeah. you know, they might have a prompt that we have or a couple of prompts and then they are looking 
for those things in their own reading, which is a great thing too. But initially it seemed to be a good thing to do. Or you could do this both things parallel, really, couldn't you? But uh, yeah. to do the read aloud was really good because we could all uh, share that, what we were doing. And we because we're all on the same text, that was a good thing. We could uh, have similar issues that we were talking about. Yeah. I think the other big thing was especially for, you know, working with middle and upper primary students, I found that the texts that they were reading for themselves, well, didn't match the ability they had to be thinking deeply about books. And so a read aloud was really about bringing a text to students and we always qualify, you know, a good read aloud is one that students in our class can't read for themselves. And so by hearing the text read aloud, they can be doing the big thinking and the big work around the text. Yeah, it doesn't matter uh, what ability that they are in reading, they can all hear that story and have their own thinking about that story. Yeah. Uh, and they can all participate. So therefore, we've got an entry for every child in the class. That's a really important point, isn't it? Yes, and really valuing their ability to be thinking through and comprehending, inferring, synthesising, summarising, you know, doing all of that work that good readers are doing. And here we're really enabling them to be practising much higher level skills and strategies in looking and, you know, looking at text and analysing and having opinions about and responding to, being able to do that with much more complex text than they can, um, that they might necessarily be able to do on their own texts. And, and I think what really helps is having some really good prompts and the prompts are not um, closed questions like, what's a good closed question? I can't think of one. But <laughs> what what colour is something, or is this a fiction or non-fiction book? Yeah. Is is so yeah. ha- having a prop that's a little open ended, um, bit of an art to changing a, a closed question into an open question. But to give you some um, uh, help there on the Teachific site, we do have some prompts. But prompts um, open ended a really great way to get that thinking going. And um, I found the kids really open up. With the right sort of prompt, they really open up. Okay, let's say the right sort of book and the right sort of prompt, they really open up with some terrific responses. I think it is important for us to think about is, so what what kinds of, you know, to be able to enable and to model the thinking of good readers and the way good readers discuss texts, we really want to be able to have some prompts to begin those conversations and to begin that thinking. So I do remember at the time thinking, yeah, well, I know that a closed question doesn't get us very far in thinking about text or engaging in conversation around text. And one of the people who really opened up my eyes and my mind to thinking about the whole, um, this whole idea of really, number one, getting children talking about books, was Aidan Chambers in his book called Book Talk. So I don't know that that book's actually in publication anymore, but his work, Aidan Chambers, in fact... Um, Aidan Chambers is still referenced frequently in, I know, on the Victorian Department for Education website. He is still referenced as could be in the response to literature section or it could be in um, writing about reading. Aidan Chambers actually worked a lot with middle school and secondary school students. Um, But from his book, Book Talk, he came up with a whole lot of conversation starters and I think that was the missing piece for me was that it was about conversation starters that if we can start with conversation and we can open up our thinking then we can get to some really powerful writing. So Aidan Chambers so these are the kinds of things that he the kinds of prompts that he began conversations with 
that I found to be really useful in getting students to then not only discuss but to write about those things. So there were things like, tell me, and he began a lot of his prompts with those two words, tell me, tell me about anything that particularly caught your attention. Uh, Tell me, what will you tell your friends about this book? What were the parts that bored you? If you gave up reading, tell me where you stopped. Wonder why you stopped there. So he'd really started a lot of this work around talking about books. And that for me was a really big way to move into making reading journals so much more powerful was by really getting my students to do some turn and tell after their reading to really get them into the habit of talking about their reading. And the purpose for that, of course, is after I've read, what would I want to do with that? I would... I absolutely want to tell people about what I've been reading. So I think it opens up for our readers a real honouring of the fact that we're not just sitting there and reading, we can engage in conversation with people about what we're reading. So if we can um, turn and tell at the end of a reading session in class, in our you know after our independent reading, and have something to talk about. So like this question, tell me about anything that particularly caught your attention. Like I would love that if I had 60 seconds to tell someone about in my reading today, do you know what really caught my attention? This was so interesting. I was so surprised about what this character did or if I'm reading something informational. Wow, that was the most interesting thing to discover that an animal can do that or whatever it is. So starting with the talk really let me explore further then, all right, what could we catch? In trying to think about other places for thinking about what kinds of things could I ask students to be thinking about um, for their reading – David Hornsby and Deborah Sakana and Joanne Parry in their book, Read On, which once again, I don't think is a publication that's available, but they divided their questions or their thinking prompts into these categories. And this was all around fiction texts. So things to do with author So an example of that. So what do you know about the author? What is this author trying to tell you in this book? What did the author have to know about to write this book? So there were some prompts that were about the author. author. And then there were... Then there's prompts about characters. Who are the main characters in your story? What do you like about the character what yeah, so there's some of, some of them a little bit closed, but then there are open ones, aren't there? Um, so who are the main characters in the story? It's closed, but I still have to make a decision about who are the main characters in my story. But then that idea of which ones do you like and why, which ones do you dislike and why, that I wouldn't ask all of those questions necessarily at the one time but that then becomes first question yes is closed but yes I'm having to make a decision on who are the main characters so you've got characters and right there's and plot, plot setting mood uh, right style illustrations okay Sharon so we've got um, David Hornsby's work and his team but also there's another area or another place you went to wasn't there A lot of us will know about Bloom's taxonomy and the different levels of um, thinking. Barrett also created a taxonomy of different types of, they were all to do with comprehension. So he organised them into, do you know, I'm just assuming it's a he and I'm not actually sure. Mm. But Barrett, it's called Barrett's taxonomy And the five categories that he divides into are literal comprehension, 
which is the explicit recognition and recall from memory. Number two, reorganisation, which is the reorganisation of ideas and information using the text, paraphrasing it in your own words. The third was inferential, where students are using their information and ideas that are explicitly stated intuition and previous experience as a basis for creating a hypothesis. Then evaluative, so evaluating, so for, judging. So for each one of these, there are some sample questions? Yes. So can you give, can us, I, give us a sample? All right, so what if I do it this way? So under literal comprehension, he has six categories and it will be around detail, main idea, sequence, comparisons, cause and effect, character traits. And a, a sample, will say, from character traits is how did the author describe the characters? So then that's thinking about, yeah, what is it? So whilst that's literal comprehension, how did the author describe them? We're going in there. We're really noticing. We're taking notice about how a character is developed. Reorganisation. So there, there's four categories, classifying, outlining, summarising, synthesising. So let's take summarising and what's the prompt there? Condense the chapters using direct or paraphrased statements. Number three, inferential. We can infer detail, main idea, sequence, comparisons, cause and effect, outcomes, language. So an example of an inferential prompt there, let's have a look at inferring the main idea. The question is, why do you think the author wrote this story? An evaluative prompt. Once again, there are four um, evaluative ones, judgments of reality and fantasy or fact and opinion, appropriateness or worth desirability. So an example of one of those, let's go with a judgment of worth. So evaluating. So was the character right or wrong in okay. what they did? The long and short of this is um, when I was using these in the classroom, it was really great to have the three sources or we might have listeners out there who've got some even better Absolutely. sources. You know, so they yes. can get back to us and tell us other places they can get some really nifty prompts from. But by having this combination of, uh, I just found it really powerful to have uh, Barrett's taxonomy, um, the David Hornsby and team work, yep. and Aidan Chambers, and they were just coming from different angles. Yes. Um, yep. And they were, it was really great because that uh, you could have some prompts that really challenged children, uh, but, yep. but they all could do it. Yes. They could all do it. And it meant that you could also, um, I remember, you know, at different times when we were working on different things in our, you know, in our literacy, that if we were, say, we were um, focusing on uh, fiction text, then I would drive the responses, the reading journal prompts would often relate to fiction text so that we could get deeper into understanding how fiction texts work. If we were working on informational text, then I, in the reading journal, might drive some of my questions around informational text. Mm. Not that they have our students have to be reading only informational text at that time, but these prompts lead us into learning more about how texts work and for us to analyse. So in the language strand, to look at text structure and organisation, yep. which is what mm. Barrett in his taxonomy gets to look at. Yeah. Um, so I did find that uh, it was really working with the read aloud. You know, I would have a chapter yes. book on the go yeah, and um, I would then be sourcing these questions or these prompts um, according to what I was reading to the kids and I would be look, scanning over to see what would be the most appropriate ones for the, for the moment of where I was in that book and what I want them to respond to. Yes. One of the important things is we want our students to be thinking about their reading 
but we're not getting them to respond in a reading journal every day. No, and every gonna, time we read. I was going to say that it was kind of a – well, if you want a routine, I think once a week was good. Yeah, and and that's – and I guess that's the one thing that I think, you know, in all of this is like how do we make this work? Yes, you know, it would be good to have all of those things or to do all of those things, but how how does it become workable whilst remaining meaningful and um, useful to our readers – you know, to our students. So so the idea of a once a week opportunity to write something within the text, in their reading journal, in a more expanded form, really, really was then a great way to be able to see inside our children's heads for all of those wonderful things that, you know, they've talked about, discussed, but to catch, for them to catch some of those things, for us to be able to understand what they're understanding. And I love that you talked about, I think you were much better at me than this, where you wrote back to students, not just the, oh, good work, or but really responded genuinely to what they shared around and, their and reading. because and because it was a shared experience with the read aloud, I understood about you know what the whole story was about, and they they did as well. So when they responded, I could really give a rich and meaningful response. Yeah, I found that over the course of a year, I I certainly didn't just limit it to the read aloud. No, because to only respond to the read aloud then doesn't let them move on to using those same kinds of prompts or that same kind of thinking to apply to their own reading. Mm. And it definitely um, elevated, it. for me, it was a missing piece to go straight into reading journals and get them to respond to their own reading without them having had any big experience with book discussions, that book talk, and catching some of that around books that we were reading, the really, the really wonderful, tantalising texts that we were reading as read-alouds. So I think anchor charts with some of these prompts would be terrific in the classroom because then they could draw on those when they are responding to their reading, when they're just doing it, not, through, not a read-aloud, but it's their own reading that they're responding to. Absolutely. So that so that if I've responded, I know that one of the things that um, I we would put into a reading journal was what were we thinking about? So what was the prompt? So that that actually became a record of all the kinds of prompts that we'd we'd used. So a child could just look back in their own journal too to go. Do you know this is that's what I'm. I want to do a response, you know, around that. So just telling everyone that there's a range of uh, reading prompts on Teachific at the moment and a growing number of them. So just watch out on the site for that. Uh, we'll keep you posted. And also in the show notes, um, it'll update you with what's going on. There's just one other yep. thing that I wanted to mm. add into, um, that over the course of a year, like we talked about, that you know, sometimes I want them responding to you know, the read-alouds. Sometimes I want them responding to their own texts and a variety of texts. So this is another way to, of enabling students that opportunity to not just always be reading the same kinds of things, but to also really be encouraged to move into some kinds of texts that they might not have experienced before. Or, or it could be a viewing. Or viewing. Mm. In what do you mean? Well, responding to something. Something that, viewed. Yeah. Yeah. Viewed. Yeah. Also, I just wanted to mention that the little ones, um, Foundation Year One, uh, can respond through drawing and writing. Yeah, and labelling. Uh, and labelling. Yes, yep. and writing. Mm. Absolutely. It's good to have these on anchor charts. Yep. Um, it is really useful to have them as on anchor charts. And if I said, you know, were there any other tips for getting um, reading journals working, 
one of the other tips would be that the prompt is there before we do the reading. Otherwise, we are really operating in that same way again of just asking students to recall things after they've read or after they've listened to text. So they know what they're looking for before they read. Yeah. Yep. We want yep. students, we want our readers to be active in their reading and to really be aware of the thinking that they're doing as they read that helps them to get a better understanding of what they're reading. All right, so just wrapping up now, Sharon, let's just rattle off what are some of the great advantages of having a reading journal going on in your classroom. Now, we can just, you know, pick any one that you'd like. I'd, I'd right, just, are you starting? I'll start. Yep. creates a great opportunity for meaningful responses. It certainly catches... It's, it's an amazing record. It's like a child's reading story across a year to see all of the things that they have responded to in a reading journal. If we really are making it meaningful, those responses really are deep and purposeful and students do respond wholeheartedly and with such insight. So as a record for a student, for parents, for us as teachers to look back at that and see, yeah, it's it's such a powerful record. So hence our title, The Hidden Power of Reading Journals. You know, this is something that you sort of discover that this is what's amazing about this. It shows students choosing and using comprehension strategies so they're visible in a meaningful way. Yeah, so it really lets us know the deep meaning that they are making by the big questions, by the big open-ended prompts that we're asking. So that's where I suppose we can link back to, you know, where we were feeling so dissatisfied with the question and answer sheets that we were giving our students to read and respond to, that this actually... Like really their responses can only be as good as the prompts they're given. Mm. It really brings it alive. Um, it ge- I think we mentioned this before, but it gives a very real purpose for their writing. Uh, no one is really stuck for ideas because they've got such great content to write about. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think it's the one area that we – I know we're all – time limited but I think it's one area well maybe I fall into it certainly fell into the trap of that I didn't have time to get my students to actually write about that you know that it was uh, if they did a book review yes they could do it in that way but I was never really giving them the opportunity to and and we talk a lot about this in the three selves of being self-motivated self-directed and self-regulated This is letting them respond using their thinking. And it's not about being right or wrong and coming up with, well, I came up with an answer. Is it right? Is it wrong? It's really about the exploration of the understanding that they have created. Uh, Well, it's one of our timeless T's, thinkers talking. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. And, and the writing is really, it's just that wonderful tool to capture yep. that thinking. And, you know, uh, it captures uh, their thinking about quality literature. You know, not, yes. not just an excerpt that's, that you have to comment on or whatever. Yeah, and, and I think I know that's, you know, for me when I thought if I've got my students responding to excerpts, when am I getting them doing the big thinking across a whole book and how am I finding out about that? Mm. Like even a book review doesn't tell me that. Mm. Mm. Um, You know, I love the arts and teaching the arts and um, I found that we could bring our artwork into this work. Um, They would do beautiful drawings and headings and whatever. I'd, I'd combine art with these responses and that was fantastic. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yes. To have an artistic representation, yep. um, yeah, is because we should. When we talk about 
reading journals, they aren't going to be just contained to writing. So keywords, phrases. Um, yes, we might write some things in sentences around our thinking and our understanding. We might be creating character webs to show how characters connect with each other. We may be visualising our thinking a and story map and story mapping. Yeah, um, we might be summarising chapters as we are reading through a visual representation. So it's like a storyboard. So um, yeah, absolutely, an artistic representation. Another one is we can reflect on the effectiveness of our own teaching. Yes, yes. I couldn't agree more. Because we're, we're kind of getting feedback on that, aren't we? Yes. Through them writing. Yes. Yeah. It is about, I think that comes back to their responses, the thinking that they're doing is really driven. Like we, we have to teach our students about our readers, about the thinking that good readers do as they are reading mm. so that they can get to these big thoughts and if we're finding that they are confused, you know, if we're seeing lots of confusion about, you know, that they're not getting to the ideas of what they're reading, then then there's the very thing for us to go, oh, let me model, let me show, let me talk about what good readers do to be able to do that. And tied up with that is you're developing a relationship with the student, so... There's that aspect as well, isn't it? That that's yeah, uh, and that just improves your all your teaching anyway, yes, doesn't it? Yeah, um, and and that's the the reading journals are a great place for us to do the noticing. Yep. Notice what is it that they are doing well. Noticing what is it that they are still learning to do, and not to go well. They're not very good at it. To really come back at okay, well, how can I help them be? get better at that Mm. so we do want to use it as a mirror on the thinking strategies and the kinds of prompts we're giving them to do the thinking and allowing us to see uh, into the minds of our students yes yeah do you know I've just remembered one of the other really important functions of the reading journal for me was that it wasn't just that I would respond to students' thinking. There were days where I would ask students to share their reading journal entry or their page or their whatever they've done. Um, Share that with a partner. Share that with a peer so that they could talk through the very things that they'd discovered, learnt about, And you said something so important before, Phil, about how engaging this is for students. They've got things to write about. They're writing about either the book being read to them or they have, you know, the books they're reading. Now, if they're reading things they're not interested in and therefore they're writing really, you know, saying, oh, well, I'm not enjoying my book or, um, you know, I didn't like things about this book, well, then there's... There's a teaching point for us. They, they haven't yet found books that they're after. So letting them being able to talk about their books with uh, their reading journals with others is another great way to use them. In fact, when I would teach older students and if I ever had any support staff or parents coming in to work with students... I would often send them with their reading journal to say, have a chat about what you're reading and share what you've been thinking about it. So there really are a whole lot of hidden powers, aren't there, in this uh, we discovered in our own teaching. And we'd love to hear any feedback of anyone trying this out or you may already be doing this. Um, just wrapping this up now, there is a great PDF on Teachific which Sharon has created called Reading Response Journals, Getting to the Heart of Reading. That's part of the professional reading section on the site. 
So we've got resource types on the left-hand side on the TeachFX site, and there's classroom resources or there's professional reading now, so that simplifies that. But if you want to look more at categories, they're at the top of um, the menu bar where you can go into the categories of lots of different categories of resources. Yeah, mm. and so and we've actually also made a dedicated area for reading journals. Yes, so if you go into reading and then subcategory reading journals or notebooks, and that is where you will find a lot of these prompts. Yes, yeah. Um, in fact, the reading, the professional reading will be there. We've uh, oh, All the links will be on the show notes, by the yes, way. Yes, yep. yeah. Okay. Um, and we've also, um, reading journals, I think are such a critical part, are such a hidden gem yep. of hidden a tool. Pa- hidden powers. Have hidden powers um, that there's even a rubric. Actually... It's what's called a one-point rubric, which means it's really a checklist. It's what are the elements that we would look for in powerful reading journal responses. So that you'll also find up there on Teachific. Um, And the other thing I was just going to say, that because we've been talking about, this is, you know, one of the other hidden pluses for reading journals, if it is made a once a week activity, where do we find the time for it? So one of the ways that some of the teachers I work with and that I found to be a useful way was for one of my reading sessions, one of my independent reading sessions in the week, I took a little bit of time off that reading session and added it to my reflect share part of that day. So rather than having, say, 20 minutes of reading and 10 minutes of share or five minutes of share, I went with a 15-minute read and a 10-minute reading journal or 10, 15-minute reading journal writing time. I know that sometimes I also use that as a home activity where it might be finished off at home. But if it becomes a routine, if it does become a a weekly thing that you do, you'll find your students actually asking, maybe it's, you know, when it's finishing off work time or there's a quiet moment, can I go on with? So. Okay, we'll wrap that up now. The hidden powers of reading journals. But Now, Sharon, highlighting some books for this week. Yes, just wanted to do a quick little run through. One, Evie and Rhino by Nerida McMullen. It is on 2023's Children's Book Council Book of the Year Award list. It's shortlisted and such. it's historical fiction. It's based on true events. Set in 1891, on a stormy night off the coast of southern Australia, a ship transporting a cargo of exotic animals tosses and turns in enormous seas. So the SS Bancura is the ship that comes unstuck and it begins, so for those of you in Victoria around the Cape Otway area, you'll know this well, but This was one of the um, ships in the 1800s that was travelling between Australia and India, transporting animals. So in this shipwreck, there is this wonderful story of this rhinoceros and the young girl, story of friendship, grief, how to make connections and how to bring about change and healing. So I found it such a wonderful read It's got some great features in it, lots of ink drawings of schedules and telegraphs and things that children won't necessarily know about anymore, some of the uh, drawings of the flora and fauna. So I've absolutely loved reading that one, Evie and Rhino. For a 10, 11-year-old age range, Um, the other two books I just quickly want to mention I want to mention, because I've talked about both of them recently, in fact I didn't set about talking about them, I showed one uh, to a group of teachers 
And after that, it was out of the 20 teachers there, five of the teachers said, oh my goodness, that's one that I really want to read to my students. So for the middle years, um, so it's Little Fur, The Legend of Little Fur by Isabel Carmody. So it is a fantasy story. So if you're interested in introducing um, legends of fantasy into your your young reader's experience, then Little Fur, I can highly recommend. What age group, Sharon? Yeah, for the middle middle primary years. Um, and it starts, Chapter 1, The Secrets of Trees. In the middle of a great sprawling grey city was a place that no human had ever entered. So year three, four, five, mm-hmm. great read. Um, in fact... I'm probably all of these books are at that year three, four, five, six level. The other one that I'm just bringing back, it's an oldie, but it's one to revisit, I think, if you haven't for a while. And that's the Spiderwick Chronicles. That is a series of books. If you've got young readers who are, you know, in that year three, four age range and they're looking for chapter book to really get them going and really get them rollicking along with a series, then The Spiderwick Chronicles uh, by Tony D. Terlitzi and Holly Black. I think are, once again, lots of ink drawings through them, as did Little Fur, also has ink drawings, all chaptered, great. I love always love the chapter names in this book or in this series. Chapter 1, in which the Grace children get acquainted with their new home. Chapter 2, I bet it starts with, in which, yes, in which two walls are explored by vastly different methods. Now, all of these books have just got wonderful vocabulary, really extends our readers into wonderful worlds with rich and strong vocabulary that builds incredible images, full of emotion, full of really powerful messages for our students at those ages. Literature is such a powerful tool in your classroom to enhance your teaching, really. Yeah. It's your teaching friend. Yeah, it is. And and every author, every book that comes into your class is a mentor sitting right with the person reading the book. You know, they have so much to teach us, so much to teach us about ourselves and our world and others and about how all of that works. Well, I think that's a really good wrap-up today, Sharon, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. We've loved to have you subscribing to our episodes from all corners of the world The Teacher's Toolkit podcast is all about giving you an insider's guide to top teaching ideas, tools, techniques in literacy, teaching and learning. Please subscribe to our weekly newsletter via the website. You will receive advance notice on blogs, podcasts, events and ways to contact us. Thank you to all of you and all the best to you, our listeners. Bye, everyone. Catch you next time. Thanks for listening to the podcast. To make sure you don't miss any literacy learning tips and insights, please subscribe to our show on your favourite podcast player. At Q Learning, our literacy specialists draw on over 30 years of teaching and international consulting experience to deliver world-class learning solutions. We equip, empower and support teachers to become their authentic selves. To find out about upcoming webinars and about how Q can help you and your school, visit qlearning.com.au. And you can get even more amazing teaching resources right now at teachific.com.au. Stay tuned.